Good to see you all here today. Have you ever been lost? Anybody ever been lost here? Well, I was once, but I don't remember it very well. But I do remember a story that happened when I was a pastor. It was some years ago. Have you been lost? When I was little. When you got lost in a beach. On a beach. Well, that's scary, isn't it? Well, that's what happened to this little boy. Their parents found you, and that's a good part of the story, isn't it? That's the thing about being lost. And that's very similar to what I want to tell you about. There was a little boy that I knew. I knew his family very well. I know there's family. And I think he was in first grade, no more than second. He was on his first field trip from school. You know what that is? When you get on a bus and you go somewhere? And that school had what's called a school forest, which is like a big area of woods. And they'd go there and they'd learn about insects and leaves and stuff like that, right? They'd learn about nature. And they'd gone, he'd gone on his first one, and he was very excited. Now, if you've ever been on a school bus trip, they count everybody going on, and they count everybody coming off, right? To make sure nobody gets left. Well, they were out at the school forest, they went on, they did all their things, and he needed to use the restroom, so he ran in the bathroom, and he was in there a while, and meantime, they counted, but they must not have counted right, because the bus is all left without him. So when he came out of the bathroom, nobody was there. Nobody in that whole wooded area. Nobody at all. And he was pretty scared. So he went back in the bathroom and he, he told me he stayed in there a little while. And then he came out and he walked around and he kept looking and he went back in. Meantime, the bus got back to school because the count was okay there. They didn't take it getting off. And they went in until they got to the classroom and the teacher looked around and said, where is he? Nobody knew. Things started to happen. Now his mother is a teacher and she was a teacher in that school at that time. And so they called her. And so her story picks up after this. And she said, of course, they were scared to death and they jumped in the car. They drove back out to the school forest. They got out and they started running through the, all around the woods yelling for him. And pretty soon they come back and, and there he is peeking at him through the door to the bathroom. And of course, he's very upset. He'd been in there hiding and he was afraid to come out. And then he came out and they found him. Of course, his mom grabs him and hugs him and they're really happy. And, and he's happy. And she told me that what he said to her, he looked up at her and said, you know, I knew you'd come find me. I knew if I waited, you'd come find me. Now, that's a very important thing, and that's what you told us, too. When you're lost, someone came looking for you, didn't they? They didn't just wait for you to find your way back, did they? They came looking for you. And that was the story here, too. And that's a story about God, and I think it's a very important one. Because, you see, God understands that we need God. And in that way, we're kind of lost. That's what the scriptures say. And what God did was send Jesus to come into the world so that we might find a way to be found, to look for us, to, 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 to find us. And so in a way, by Jesus coming, you and me and everyone here and everybody in the world in some way has been found by God. And God loves us, knows us, cares for us, each and every one of us, every one of us. And if you go out these doors, every one of us, and if you travel the country, every one of us. If you travel the world, every one of us. We were lost, the scriptures tell us, and now we're found. So if you ever do get lost, remember, somebody who loves you is going to come looking, right? They're not going to leave you lost. They're going to come looking, and you will be found by those who love you. But just the same way, a God who loves you beyond all expression, beyond any kind of way that we can understand, loves you too, and will never let you be lost. will always be with you, okay? That's the story about Jesus, isn't it? Let's pray. Mighty and loving God, we are so grateful for the young folks that we are privileged to have as a part of our community of faith. We're thankful for the children in our community, our world, that, and, and we're thankful for the responsibility you have placed upon us concerning them all, our own children, our own homes, most certainly, but also children everywhere. We're responsible to see for their safety, their care, their protection, their future, so that they might know a world of peace and prosperity and freedom. That is incumbent on all of us, God. So we're grateful for the life we enjoy here. And we pray that throughout this world, all children may grow up in peace. Now, we know that's a difficult request, but we also know nothing is beyond you. And no one is lost to you. So we give thanks for these children with us. We ask your blessing upon them and children everywhere this day. This we pray in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, guys. Appreciate it.
with me the prayer for illumination. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer, through Christ, amen. The reading this morning is from Ruth 1, verses 6 through 18, which is in your pew Bible in the New Testament on page 289. Sometime later, Naomi heard that the Lord had blessed his people by giving them good crops. So she got ready to leave Moab with her daughters-in-law. They started out together to go back to Judah, but on the way she said to them, go back home and stay with your mothers. May the Lord be as good to you as you have been to me and to those who have died. And may the Lord make it possible for each of you to marry again and have a home. So Naomi kissed them goodbye, but they started crying and they said to her, no, we will go with you to your people. You must go back, my daughters, Naomi answered. Why do you want to come with me? Do you think I could have sons again for you to marry? Go back home, for I am too old to get married again. Even if I thought there was still hope, and so got married again tonight and had sons, would you wait until they had grown up? Would this keep you from marrying again or marrying someone else? No, my daughters, you know that's impossible. The Lord has turned against me and I feel very sorry for you. Again, they started crying. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and went back home. But Ruth held on to her. So Naomi said to her, Ruth, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her God. Go back home with her. But Ruth answered, Don't ask me to leave you. Let me go with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and that is where I will be buried. May the Lord's worst punishment come upon me if I let anything but death separate me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. A little over 3,000 years ago, a family left their homes in and around the area of a city called Bethlehem, pretty familiar to us, located in the Galilee. And they left and they began traveling to the east, crossing the Jordan River and entering into the land of Moab. Last week I told you a little bit about Moab. Moab gets its name from the son of Lot, who was named Moab. He was their founder of that, of the, that group of people, that tribe. Uh, they remembered that history very well. And they also remembered the history of animosity that existed between them and Israel, the Israelites. It went way back to the time, literally, of Abraham. But they still knew, remembered that, and they remembered that they had warred back and forth many times. And now this family, this Israeli family, was going there to live. Why would they do such a thing? Why would they leave their home? Well, as it turns out, there had been a terrible drought in the land. Now, droughts in the ancient world were very serious business. You know, a drought is a serious business in our time. It can affect an entire area's agriculture. But it doesn't necessarily mean people are going to starve because we're such a big nation, such a big world, that we can share our food, we can ship it by rail and truck and plane and whatever is necessary to get it to people in need. So we don't very often experience in our world today, at least not in the Western Hemisphere, these kinds of things that would cause somebody to flee from their home because of their fear of starvation. They were food refugees, you could say. And they, they were moving away from that place, going away, leaving their home, their families, everything there. And they had to or they would surely have starved to death, if not in that winter, surely in the spring to follow. Because remember, these people not only grew crops so that they might eat and live through the winter, but also so they might feed their cattle and they might have seeds to seed into the ground for the following year. So a drought of even one year had, uh, had consequences that went on for two or three more years. So they go there not knowing how long they're going to be there in Moab. They go there not sure what's going to happen when they get there. But they go because it's absolutely necessary that they do. 
When they get there, they settle down. Now, we don't know. The story doesn't tell us what their experience was like, but our knowledge of history and human nature, as we look at this, tells us something that we can pretty well determine that they were not particularly welcome there. Undoubtedly, they were seen as being untrustworthy, foreigners, somebody to be, you know, to be, stay clear of. But somehow as a family, they survived. They made it, at least for a while. They must have built some kind of a home because they homesteaded there. They must have found a way to make a living because they did. And the two sons that they had must not have been able to find Jewish wives because they married women who were Moabites. Now, why would I say that? Because there is a very powerful tradition in the Jewish world concerning marrying within your own national heritage, within your own tradition, within your own blood. To marry outside of the Jewish people is, is to somehow dishonor your ancestors. And so strong was it what, concerning women was is that your Jewishness was passed to you through your mother, not through the father. So that these children that would be born to these, these two young men would not be accepted as ever being truly Jewish. They would never be totally accepted. So in marrying these women, now we, I'd love to believe the romantic side of the story, and some people have told it that way. You know, love finds a way, and, and I think that's probably more true. They probably found they, uh, two young women they fell in love with, and they married them. Now, in the ancient world, it was traditional that the husband and the wife would, as they first came there, would have a home to live in. You know, the, the parents would have the parents' house. And if they had sons, the sons then would return when they were to get married, and they would build an addition onto their parents' house most often. Now, I've thought about this. We have five boys. We'd have been living in a compound, you know. But they would build an addition onto their home, and then they would bring, when that was ready, they would bring their bride home, and that woman would literally become a part of their family. The daughter-in-law was a very different role in those days and in that culture than it is in ours. And they would live together, and they would have to find a way to live together. Even though they had walls that separated them, they would have common table. They would have a common fate and a common future. So these two sons have wives who are from the Moabite tribe. Now Naomi's husband dies. We don't know why. We don't know how soon after in the story, but he dies. And we don't know if it's because of health. We don't know if it's because of overwork. We don't know what happened, but he died. But Naomi still had her sons. You see, that's how widows were provided for in the ancient world. The first and most important relationship that you had as a widow was with your family. Your next of kin, your closest male relative was now responsible for you, and that was your sons. And if not them, your brother. And if not them, your uncle or somebody was responsible to make sure you made it. So she had her sons, and, that, and they could live like that. And years go by. We know that they were there about 10 years. So years go by, but in that time, both of her sons die. We don't know if they die at the same time. Doesn't seem like it. Seems like there was some space. But we don't know, uh, you know, which is which. But they both died, and now you have a home with three widows in a, what is, for Naomi, a foreign culture. And the situation changes dramatically for her. She's heard from back in Judea that things were better now, that the crops were restored, that animals were back. People were having a crops again, and, and their life was going back to a normal cycle of life. But 10 years had gone by. Just think for a minute in your own lives how long 10 years are. How much can happen in 10 years? People are born. People die. Fortunes are made. Fortunes are lost. Nations rise up sometimes and go to dust, even in that short of a time. Ten years is a long time in our lives. Now imagine in a world where the average lifespan of a male is around 40 years. Women, if they're lucky, live into their 50s, and really lucky, their 60s. Ten years is even a greater amount of time in those circumstances. Ten years, and she wants to go back. She doesn't know what she's going to find when she gets back. All she knows is the traditions of her people and the responsibilities that her men can have to her. So she says to her daughters-in-law, I'm going back, and you need to stay. 
I can't promise you a life back there. All I can do is give you my blessing. And she gives those daughters-in-law a mother's blessing. May you find a husband. May you have children. May you have a life. And she blesses them as she prepares to take their leave you know, of them when she's sending them back from the road. Now, Ophrah, in tears, doesn't want to go. Ruth, in tears, doesn't want to go. This has become for them their mother. Think of what they have gone through together. The death of Naomi's husband. The death of both of these women's husbands. They were both childless. They lived through that pain. Because in that time, in that world, having children was everything. Because that was the next generation. That was your hope, your promise for the future. They went through all of that together. They were bound together by that life of living and dying. They didn't want it to stop. They didn't want her to go away. They wanted to go with her. Ophrah, here's her mother-in-law's wisdom, as it sounds to her, and she returns to her home. Ruth clings to Naomi, and she won't go, and she makes with her a covenant. Now, I don't know if you knew she's making a covenant, but she is. In the ancient world, covenants are very special were, uh, kind of arrangements, agreements. In religious marriage, we call it the covenant of marriage, not the legal state of matrimony, the covenant. A covenant's a very special kind of promise, some very special. So she says to, to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Your land will be my land. Where you die, I will die. Where you are buried, I will be buried. And then she adds on what is common in covenants, that, uh, uh, asking that God hold her accountable to her promise. That's a covenant. And Naomi recognizes it as such. And she agrees to take Ruth with her. So she and Ruth make the very dangerous trip for women in their circumstances. Even with tradesmen and all these things going back and forth it makes the very dangerous trip and the unknown trip what they will find back to Naomi's home. And we'll talk about that more next week. But I want to think a little bit about Ruth and Naomi for a minute, particularly Ruth. You know, Naomi and her husband, Amalek, and their sons, they went to Moab. They didn't know what they were going to find. We can make some assumptions that it certainly wasn't home. They went to a place where people were very different, where people had grudges against their people, where their culture, their religion, their everything, traditions, all different than what they knew. The only thing they had in common was a slightly similar language and, and uh, written language. So they, you know, they had some commonality. They had a common heritage that they had both uh, decided to, to ignore. But they made a home. They made a family. They found a way. The young men find the women that they were in love with, they marry them, and they come into the home, and they find a way. They find a way, despite the differences that are between them, they find a way to live together in love and harmony and peace. So much so that their relationship blossoms into that like a mother and a daughter, like a loving parent and a child. They overcame all those differences. And as you'll see in the story goes on, they do overcome even more. But imagine the differences between Naomi and Ruth for just a minute. Generational differences. Experience very different other than their common experience of being together. Different religion they were raised in. Different ways of life they were raised in. And yet they found a way to overcome those differences. A 3,000 year old story stands as an example for us this very day. What it teaches us is that God created very few differences between us. The obvious physical differences, men and women, of different races, of different, you know, appearance. But every other difference that you find are made by humanity. We create those things that divide us. It's we who had come up with these ways of taking sides and, and, and dividing us. And we, you know, that's not God's way. God's way is to unify to bring people together. So how did they do it? How were they able to do it? By recognizing the humanity in each other, by living together side by side, by experiencing life through each other's eyes. 
Those differences that we make between the people whom we disagree with, whether it's political or whether it's race or whatever it is, those religious differences, everything we do, if we can find a way to sit around the table together and share a meal and share life a little, if we can realize that their lives and our lives are entwined, we're all in it together. We only got one planet. I heard that somebody say that once. Why do we treat it like we all have our own? We have one life to live, some people say, and we have one place and time to live it in. And why do we allow those things that we have created, these differences, to keep us apart? Naomi and Ruth's story is that we do not have to. Despite cultural differences, despite differences of age, despite differences of, of nationality, they were able to see each other as beloved ones. When I think about their example and I think about the circumstances of today, I think about the fact that we do not have to have what we see going on in our streets today, around our nation and around our world. We're seeing hatred on display in so many different ways. Do we forget the words of Jesus, Gandhi, if you will, Martin Luther King Jr.? Hate never stops hate. All hate does is generate more hate. Violence never ends violence. All it does is generate more violence. That lesson has been taught to us in countless ways, in terrible consequences that have come of it. Generation after generation after generation, can we not at last listen to the words of Jesus Christ? Can we at not last see the people that are outside the door, those others out there, as being the children of God? Can we not pray for them? Can we not look to them, even if we have great distaste for their positions? Can we not pray for them? I grew up hearing all my life this thing about, you know, you never hate the sinner, you hate the sin. Words. I see so much hate today. I know you do too. But we don't have to let it be that way, you and I. We can determine in our hearts and minds to take the example of Ruth and Naomi. And despite the cultural differences that maybe we experience, despite the hatred we see going on, perhaps we can live as those who hope for a better day, who look for the good in people, even if that good is not apparent, and pray for God to reach into their hearts and to change their hearts. It's not, we're not placed on earth here to, to separate ourselves from others as Christian folk. We're put here on earth and have been given the mandate by our Lord to teach them the faith. And the faith is about love, forgiveness, acceptance, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what you believe, no matter what gender you are, no matter what color you are, no matter what nationality you are. God could care less. Do you know that? Jesus teaches us that. We're the ones that seem to care about those things. It's about time we raise ourselves above that and get on the Jesus train and follow his way and start living the faith that we have been blessed with. May it be so. May God bless us. And may God bless this church, this country, and this world because, boy, do we need it right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
now may God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you, my friends. May he lead you in pathways of hope and peace and life and freedom all the days of your lives. May you know the love of God. May we all know that love and embrace it. And remember, it's a gift. And it's not a gift you're to keep. It's a gift you're to share. In Jesus' name, amen.